Well, um, hello, and I'm very flattered that so many of you have turned up to um, hear this talk, especially because I think I'm right in saying that there's no classics at Keeble. Yeah. Um, so I've come from Wadham, so obviously I had a very long journey uh, to get here. I do have a little um, packet of basically photocopies of the slides because I wasn't too sure if you'd be able to read um, the texts or not, and also if you want to argue with me in the questions, it's easier than you've got a copy. So um, maybe if the rest can pass those around if people want them. Um, okay, so the wonderful picture that I've chosen to start with is actually Alan Cummings um, as Dionysus in a production of the Bacchae in London a few years ago. And you can see that their interpretation of this character from um, a Greek tragedy, which was written in the 5th century BC, um, was very much kind of interested in the gender identity of that character. And they chose to kind of maximise and pick up on some things that we're going to look at um, that are already there and present um, in the original ancient Greek text. Um, so I'll try not to um, kind of use too many Greek uh, jargony words, but if there is anything I say that you don't understand, just stop me and um, I will um, try to re-explain it. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you some texts from Greek literature. So we're going to look at some Homer, which is one of the earliest um, examples of Greek poetry. We're going to look at uh, this play, um, which Alan Cummings was in, the Bacchae, uh, which is the story of the Greek god Dionysus, the god of wine and parties and all that good stuff, coming to Greece um, and being rejected by the king of Thebes, Pentheus, and basically Dionysus' revenge that he has. Um, on Thebes and on Pentheus for his rejection and that might be all we get time for so you'll see there is more um, in the handout but I thought better to have too much and we can just stop rather than have too little. Um, okay, so um, I guess the first question that we need to deal with is the examples that I'm going to be sharing with you today are both to do with kind of complicated masculinities or masculine figures who don't um, necessarily fit the stereotype of their gender that was popular at the time or that was kind of, um, you know, that they were supposed to fit. And the theory that I'm using um, is actually from uh, sociology. So this is a very well known scholar you may have come across, Rywin Connell, an American scholar who's worked on masculinities. And her argument is that there are, there's never just one type of masculinity in a society. There are always multiple types. And she has lots of different um, sort of categories, but the ones I'm interested in are these three. So hegemonic masculinity, uh, she would define as the masculinity that is used by a group in power. And so their gender characteristics become associated with the trappings of political or social power. And then they're able to exclude other people from power because they say, well, you don't have these characteristics. And that's what, you know, being in power means. And so obviously there are lots of examples of this in modern history as well. But Greece was very much a society um, set up for patriarchy. So a society in which women could not um, be political agents. So they couldn't have any role politically. They couldn't vote. They couldn't really own property. Uh, they were actually legal minors for their whole lives. So they were technically children under the law. And they couldn't bring a legal case on their own behalf. So if a woman was wrong, she relied on her male kurios, which is a word meaning essentially guardian, um, to bring a legal case for her. So that might be your husband or father or brother or someone. But essentially, um, Greece is a, is a place where hegemonic masculinity is very much tied up with um, political power and excluding not just women, um, but um, <coughs> males who don't fit the particular type of hegemonic masculinity. So for example, enslaved uh, men obviously were then closed off from political power as well. Um, so it's not really a hybrid masculinity, which you're going to hear me talking a lot about, because obviously I'm interested in kind of complicated masculinities, is where um, a group uh, might adopt characteristics from another gender, um, but they don't do that in order to be inclusive. They do that in order to arrogate more power to themselves. So they're reinforcing the underlying um, kind of patriarchal structure of society. Um, and so we're going to look at, at kind of how that works in um, in Greek terms. And then subordinated masculinity um, is where a group um, have characteristics which are seen as masculine, but they are denigrated by the group in power. So in Greece, an example of that would be enslaved men. So they would be seen as kind of subordinated within society. Also non-Greeks um, who were called barbarians often and kind of again seen as sort of lesser than the Greek men, the Greek ideal. 
um, and also um, obviously very different to today, to today um, in Greece, uh, homosexual relationships between two men of equal ages uh, would very much fall into the subordinated masculinity group. So they did have a, an acceptance of um, a type of homosexual relationship that was very kind of um, sort of strictly um, set with an older lover and a younger lover, and it was okay, that was acceptable, but two men of the same age in a relationship would be a bit more tricky. So that would, and we see lots of examples in Greek comedy of people um, in those types of relationships being mocked and their masculinity being kind of um, questioned. Okay, so I'm not going to say too much about this. This is just kind of some images around the hegemonic type of masculinity that you've probably seen if you've ever been to um, the British Museum or any museum with Greek or Roman artifacts. So you can see it's very bound up in a physicality. I'm not trying to argue that all Greek men look like this, of course, but this is the ideal um, that they were kind of held to in theory. Um, and it's not really a surprise that physicality is such a part of it when you think about what men would traditionally have done. Um, so what are the male kind of um, spheres of influence? It's more it's hunting and it's the, the athletic games. So we get the Olympics from Greece and there were lots of games like the Olympics all over Greece. So the physical side of things was very, very important. And so obviously then you start getting that a, a non-hegemonic male will be a male who doesn't fit this ideal, this stereotype, and we're going to see that. So if you don't match up to this physical ideal, you're going to be in trouble in the literature um, anyway. Um, OK, so we're starting off with Homer. Um, so this is um, an epic poem. It's our earliest example of Greek literature. Um, it tells the story of the Trojan War, uh, which started because Paris, um, the Prince of Troy, kidnapped, struck, ran off with Helen, um, and the Greeks obviously go to Troy to get her back. So we're kind of in Troy, and we're looking at a moment in the poem where um, Homer depicts a potential duel between Paris and Menelaus, Helen's husband, and this is going to end the war. So this is a great idea, right? We've been fighting for kind of years and years and lots of people have died. Why not just have a duel between the two men at the heart of it and whoever wins gets Helen and the war will be over. Um, and you can see here, and you use the handout if you're finding this text too small, that the men are characterised in very different ways. So Menelaus is absolutely fulfilling this kind of hegemonic masculine role. So he absolutely loves battle. He's hungry for the fight. Um, so look at the simile that he um, is compared to. So he's uh, a hungry lion um, that is kind of savaging a wild goat or a stag. He's greedy for the battle. Um, and, you know, he's not even troubled by powerful huntsmen. He's fearless. And then look at Paris. So he's sick at heart and he's compared to a man who sees a snake and is afraid of it and is trembling and has a pallid face. So there's a kind of a, a problem really between these two men um, in terms of their masculinity. Menelaus is doing it all right and Paris is definitely getting it wrong in a big way. And we then get um, a few lines later in the same part of the poem, uh, Paris' brother Hector coming to tell him off basically. So Paris, Paris runs away from the duel um, and doesn't, um, doesn't fight Menelaus because he's afraid and Hector is uh, very unhappy with this. It's probably worth noting that Hector is also very much a hegemonic masculine figure in the Iliad, so he gets it all right. He's got a, a wife and a son. Um, he, we see him operating as a successful family man, a successful politician within the city. He's also the best fighter they've got, so Hector's kind of ticking all these boxes that Paris kind of isn't. Um, so you can see here how Hector speaks to Paris and the things that he picks up on in terms of you know, how Paris is falling short. So he connects his sinfulness immediately with his appearance. So he's beautiful to look on. And he's a seducer and deceiver of women. We'll come back to that. And then we see that um, Hector is very concerned about what men think of Paris, that he's going to be an object of people's contempt. So he's very worried about sort of public perception and how it looks um, for Troy that their fighter in the duel is kind of might be pretty, but he's not very good at, at fighting. Um, you can see he carries that thought through. So the Greek, he's worried the Greeks are going to laugh and cry out that Paris was chosen only for his beauty, that he's devoid of strength and courage. And then the last part, again, maybe if um, you're new to sort of Greek culture, it might not be obvious that um, he criticizes him for playing the liar. And he says he's got gifts of Aphrodite, um, good looks and flowing locks. All of these things kind of 
it's okay for a man to play the liar in a sort of brief lull in battle. So we do see Achilles, who's, again, very much a hegemonic masculine figure of doing that. But it's not okay to play it all day instead of going to battle. And that's kind of what he's saying to Paris is that, you know, you like playing instruments. Who would have played instruments in Greek culture? Probably slaves or ex-slaves. So again, this is kind of, you know, Paris adopting a characteristic that really isn't part of the, the toolkit, if you like, of your hegemonically masculine figure. Aphrodite is a female goddess of sex and beauty, uh, so he's got gifts of Aphrodite, kind of something you would expect to be said of a woman, beautiful woman. Um, so obviously it's okay for hegemonically masculine figures to be good looking, but the, it's clear here that Paris is good looking in the wrong way, or he's not, he's not good looking in the way that Hector finds acceptable for a hero, and that that beauty seems to be incompatible with courage. And that's something we're going to see again and again. That If you're too beautiful in a feminine way, that means you cannot function on the battlefield. Um, the seducer and deceiver of women comment is important, though, because Paris isn't a complete failure. So he's not, he can't, can't fight very well. He's, he's afraid of Menelaus. He runs away. Um, but he does have Helen, and she is the most beautiful woman in the world. And we find out in the Iliad that she didn't kidnap her. She has chosen to follow him. And that's very important. Um, so she, here she regrets choosing to follow him because of all of the death and war that's followed. But it is made clear that she did leave of her own free will. So he has managed to attract the attention, if you like, with the sexual desire of the most beautiful woman in the world. And we hear from, her, from Hector that he is seducing to see other women as well. So he's obviously very successful at attracting women. And this is something that becomes a bit of a theme with these characters um, who uh, reject or are incapable of hegemonic masculinity is they might fail on the battlefield, they might fail in the hunt, but um, they're very, very successful um, sexually in attracting kind of partners and, and, and being sort of seen as um, very successful in that area of life. So just to tie up the, the Paris situation before we look at another example, um, and then maybe think about kind of how this all pans out. Um, what is the Iliad actually saying about um, Paris and his version of masculinity? What's the impact of Paris on the on the poem or on his family, on his city? Ultimately, it, it destroys his entire community. So his the poem seems to be raising some quite big questions about what happens when people don't fit that mould that is set down for them by society. And although we might see Paris being kind of criticised by his brother and he's kind of failing on the battlefield, he does have power in a way. He has a power that Hector doesn't have um, to kind of seduce people and kind of, you know, to win them over. And that is very much carried over into the second example that I wanted to share with you. Don't be afraid of the Greek. It's just there to give you a little what it looks like. I'm not going to kind of delve into it. Um, so this is from the play that I started with, the uh, back eye with the, the Alan Cummings picture on the start of the PowerPoint. Um, and Dionysus has arrived in Thebes disguised on purpose to punish Pentheus, the king of Thebes, who has essentially rejected him, doesn't believe that he's a real god, doesn't want to know, doesn't want his new religion in Thebes. And Dionysus disguises as a young and beautiful stranger. Um, it's important to say that he's um, a non-Greek, um, so he's a foreigner, and I think that's kind of part of this um, non-traditional, non-hegemonic masculinity that he's presenting. Um, so you can see the language that Pentheus is using here of um, Dionysus stroke the stranger, and it, it looks quite similar to how Paris is described in the Iliad. So he's got sweet smelling hair in golden ringlets and Aphrodite's charms in his wine dark eyes. So again, his beauty is something that might be seen as more traditionally feminine. Um, and also Pentheus is very worried about the effect this is going to have on the female population. So he hangs around the young girls day and night, luring them in with his joyful mystery. So you can kind of see that, again, a non-hegemonic masculinity is linked with being very attractive to the uh, women um, in the society. Um, this is just from a bit later in the play. So Pentheus is um, wants to capture Dionysus because he's he's had enough of him running about and misbehaving in Thebes. And there's a couple of things I want you to notice here. Um, so this is the one place I will talk very briefly about um, the Greek. Um, so you can see I've bolded a Greek word and underlined an English word. 
Um, so he calls him the effeminate stranger. And that's kind of an okay translation, I think, for this word. Um, Thelumorphon literally means something like female shaped or woman shaped. So morphon is like where we get morph, morphic, and then thelus is female. So he's really kind of interested in how Dionysus appears and that his appearance is kind of not what he would associate with a masculine character. And again, he connects this immediately with sex, right? It's corrupting the women. So he's an effeminate stranger who's corrupting our women and infecting our beds. So this kind of um, appearance that Dionysus has um, definitely having the same effect as Paris on Helen. The other thing to note is that Pentheus is a kind of stereotype of the hegemonic masculine figure, right? So he's a king and his response throughout the play, as here, is one of violence and kind of autocratic top down power. So he's kind of going to arrest uh, Dionysus and I'm going to make him suffer a punishment by stoning. And so you sort of see the conflict between these two characters playing out where you've got a kind of hegemonically masculine figure and a hybrid, we might say, um, masculine figure. Um, and, you know, the play is really interested in the tension between the two. So, yeah, this is just another example of Pentheus uh, being really violent. Um, so I won't say too much about it, but um, he is here engaging in wrecking a shrine because he doesn't like what the prophet has said to him. So it's just a kind of further proof of his um, kind of use of violence to exercise his power. Um, so we get to the point where Pentheus actually meets Dionysus. So he's captured him and he pulls him in. And again, you can see how he's describing um, Dionysus, uh, his appearance. So his hair is long, not through wrestling, scattered over your cheeks full of desire. So we start to wonder if Pentheus is really as annoyed at Dionysus as he seems, or whether he actually quite likes the way he looks, um, even if he doesn't want to admit that to himself. And he says, you have a white skin from careful preparation. That, again, might not be such an obviously female coded thing uh, today, but um, in Greek um, culture and literature, there was a sort of idea that women were white and men were tan because women would stay inside all the time. So it's part of this kind of control of women and the kind of prevention of women in the political sphere extended to uh, the notion that if possible, a woman would stay inside in the women's quarters and the men would go out and do the hunting and the farming and the war and get a tan and the women would stay inside. And you can see how deeply encoded this is in the mindset on these two Greek vases. So the reason it's so silly is that on the left hand side, you've got um, Achilles and Penthesilea. She's an Amazon, so she's non-Greek, so very unlikely to have been white anyway. And the Amazons were a matriarchal tribe who lived their lives outside hunting and going to war. So she absolutely would not have been white, but so deeply ingrained in the Greek mindset that women are white, that on the vase, she has to be white, even though she obviously wasn't. Um, so it kind of shows you that when Dionysus turns up with this very pale skin, that's a, a very kind of bold move in terms of his gender presentation. So for Pentheus, he's kind of going, you know, how, what, what am I supposed to make of this person? Um, the vase on the right, um, you've got a goddess, uh, the goddess of war. So again, probably unlikely to have been very pale, would be out in the sun all the time, but again, presented as, um, as being white. Um, so... In this play, then, the gender presentation of Dionysus is seen as very dangerous. It's seen as something that will kind of disrupt the normal uh, workings of society. And that kind of does happen to a certain extent. So he's not actually seducing all the women in the way that Pentheus fears, but he does drive the women out of their homes onto the mountainside to worship him in rites, which Pentheus is very suspicious about. And Pentheus wants to go and see what's happening. And this is kind of the hinge point for me in this play and the kind of probably the moment where the, the kind of play's commentary on gender presentation is at its most pointed. In order to go and see these women doing their secret Dionysi uprights on the mountain, Dionysus convinces Pentheus to dress up in women's clothing. So we have this kind of scene where the hegemonic masculine figure who's been kind of striding about and 
you know, acting violence on people and kind of doing this very top-down power thing is now dressing as a woman and we have a kind of dressing up scene. Um, so I just underline some key moments in this that um, are worth noticing. So the first thing is that to note that dressing in women's clothes seems to change for Pentheus or potentially change his entire gender identity. So just literally putting on a linen dress. So you can see uh, Dionysus says, put linen clothes on your body. And Pentheus's answer is, shall I then, instead of a man, be reckoned among the women? And so I, I don't really have an answer to this question, but I wonder who he's worried about, you know, who's doing the reckoning and who gets to decide whether he's a man or a woman and why does just putting a dress on potentially undermine his identity so much? Um, and then Dionysus obviously says, that, yes, if you're seen there as a man among the um, among my worshippers, they'll kill you. So it's all to do with kind of seeing and being seen. Um, and then we obviously note that he feels shame at the idea of dressing as a woman. So that gives you a, another confirmation that the performance of masculinity is tied up with political power, right? So he feels that it's shameful to wear the clothes of another um, gender identity. Um, so yeah, again, this, this is just kind of continuing those themes. So he's very reluctant to put on the woman's dress. So that's really what this slide is about. So I could not put on a woman's dress. Um, and then he says, anything is better than to be mocked by the Bacchae. So he's very afraid of being mocked. And there's a lot of kind of unpacking there to do around kind of shame and um, how he's presented himself. So he's gone off and put the women's clothes on. And this is where he comes back out. Um, Dionysus is now in control. So in the previous, up to this point in the play, Pentheus has arrested Dionysus. He's threatened him with violence. He's threatened the prophet with violence. And Dionysus had to persuade him to put the women's clothes on. So you know that even though Dionysus is a god, he didn't just kind of go, right, there you go, I'm going to put these clothes on you. It was a sort of manipulation. The moment when Pentheus comes out dressed as a woman, he's lost all of his power. He never has any power again in this play. And Dionysus is in control. So he says, you know, come out, you're going to be seen by me wearing the clothing of a woman of an inspired Maenad, that's just a, a worshipper of Dionysus. But the other thing to notice here, which is really, really interesting, is that he hasn't just lost his political power, he's also lost his rationality. So he's gone mad. So you can see here, he, he doesn't see straight, so he can see two sons and two thieves. And he can see Dionysus not as a beautiful man, but as a bull. So he's kind of having visions. And I think what's really interesting is this kind of connection. It's not, it's not an accident, this connection between feminine clothing or femaleness and irrationality, because they did believe that women were irrational and that men were rational. And so this is kind of an enactment of that cultural idea happening on stage. So what happens to Pearl Pentheus? I'm afraid um, he does get torn. This is fabulous. He gets torn limb from limb by the female members of his family. And I think this is really important as well. So, you know, his physical power is diminished simply by the act of having dressed as a woman and he's rendered kind of helpless and powerless and they then tear him to shreds and there's a very gory description of it um, in the play. Um, so he kind of completely loses every vestige of power that he had at the start. And it all seems to be very much tied up in um, this kind of dressing up as a woman, relinquishing his masculine identity simply by putting on um, a dress and um, a headband. And ov obviously Dionysus very much maps onto, um, pen uh, onto Paris in the Iliad. So he adopts kind of cynically this hybrid masculine identity where he's very beautiful and he has some sort of feminine characteristics and he uses that to manipulate the other characters in the play. And just like Paris destroys his whole community, Dionysus destroys the whole community of Thebes, but Paris sort of does it unintentionally, and Pentheus weaponizes that um, kind of gender fluidity as a way of getting revenge on a community that has rejected him. Um, but in both cases, I think it's important to note that um, Hector, the hegemonically masculine character, and Pentheus, also hegemonically masculine, are very afraid of the effect that 
um, male characters who don't fit the gender stereotypes of the hegemonic male. They're very afraid of what effect they have on women, and they're very sure that they are much more attractive to women than the hegemonically masculine characters. And I, I don't really have an answer to this either, and so this is the kind of seedlings of a, of a book that I'm working on, but I wonder if this is all part of the kind of the anxieties that are caused in a society where the genders are so pinned on and so kind of strictly enforced and they live very separate lives. So if women are living a completely separate life in every way, you know, they have no links with men uh, in terms of, you know, education, in terms of politics, in terms of anything, how can they ever have a meaningful relationship? How can they interact? And, and maybe questions are being asked about, well, what do women really want? you know, in a partner? Do they want someone they can relate to? Like Paris, who stays inside all day with the women, polishing his armour and sort of brushing his hair and playing the lyre. And I think there's there's definitely a bit of anxiety there. What we would want. Um, so I think we'll, we'll stop um, there. Um, and I won't talk about Clytem Nextro um, because uh, that would take a long time. But anyway, thank you very much for listening.